Hi, everyone who's just joining us. Um, we're just waiting for everyone to join us here on the webinar. We'll be getting going in a couple of minutes. Um, as you're settling in, please introduce yourselves to us in the chat panel on the right hand side. We love to hear who you are, where you're from, your union, that sort of stuff. Hi everyone who's just joined us, um, welcome to the webinar. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us. Um, we will be getting going in a couple of minutes. In the meantime, please uh, introduce yourself to us in the chat. It's great to see so many people already doing that. Hi everyone who's joining us. Uh, great that you're all able to join us today, even though it's the Easter break from school. Um, we'll be getting going in a second. Um, great to see everyone introducing themselves in the chat already. We also do have uh, live captions. If you want to switch them on now, you can. There's a button at the bottom of the screen that says live transcript. Um, please click that if you want to see the webinar with subtitles. Okay, I think we might get going because uh, numbers seem to be settling down. Right, so welcome to today's webinar, everybody. Um, we will be talking today about fire and rehire tactics. Um, we did try to do this webinar a few weeks ago, so we've rescheduled this, and I'm really pleased today that Neil is with us. Uh, Neil Todd is from Thompson Solicitors, um, and uh, we had a couple of technical issues a few weeks ago so it's great that he's here today. So just a bit of um, housekeeping before we get going. So I'm Anna from the TUC and I'll get Neil to introduce himself in a second. Um, we've got a chat panel on the right hand side so really good to see people chatting there um, and telling us a bit about, about yourselves. Um, if you've got any questions for Neil, you can post them in the Q&A button, which is underneath us at the bottom of the screen. Um, we will try to answer as many questions as we can after Neil's done his presentation about fire and rehire tactics. Um, but we, if we don't get to all of them, don't worry, we'll take those into account and we will use it to inform any um, guidance we put out on this subject for you. Um, uh, for those of you who didn't hear my earlier announcement, we do have live captions. So if you want to uh, see those, press the button that says live captions at the bottom of the screen also. Uh, we're also at the TUC, we're very interested to hear about people's experiences of fire and rehire, if they've got any stories that they want to share with us. Um, if you do, please feel free to email us on tuceducation at tuc.org.uk. My colleague Alice will put that email address in the chat panel now. We will treat everything you tell us confidentially, but we, if you if it is, do have a story that you want to share, please feel free to email, email us. Right, um, fire and rehire um, is something that we've all probably heard a lot about in recent weeks. Um, our research shows that one in 10 workers have been asked to reapply for their jobs on worse terms and conditions since the first lockdown a year ago. So um, we've invited Neil Todd from Thompson Solicitors to talk to us today about this uh, tactic that employers use and your legal rights surrounding it. So Neil, over to you. Can you just introduce yourselves, please, and tell us a little bit about um, what, uh, what, what, you know, the, the legal background to this area? Thank you, Anna. Yes, sorry, my name's Neil Todd uh, and I'm a, a solicitor in uh, at Thompson Solicitors. 
Uh, and one of the areas that I work in uh, a lot is collective labour law. Um, and that obviously, um, in particular, uh, around these sort of large scale fire and uh, rehire exercises. Um, and what I really want to do today is just um, uh, make a couple of opening remarks uh, and then talk to you about uh, some of the legal obligations that do exist around rehire, uh, fire and rehire. And then really just to conclude about um, uh, how to situate, you know, what the situation is like here compared to um, other jurisdictions and in, in other countries and just sort of uh, contrast the situation and perhaps with a view as to where uh, legislative changes uh, may follow as a result of sort of campaigning by unions. Um, so to, to begin with, I mean, sadly, fire and uh, rehire is, is, is very much on the landscape at the moment. And certainly uh, within Thompson's, we're seeing uh, a number of these exercises being undertaken by employers um, and not just confined to the private sector either. We're also seeing these sort of exercises being um, sadly conducted in, in the public sector. Um, I suppose as a headline point and, and, and not one that is going to surprise anyone here is that, I mean, the exercise is not unlawful uh, per se. So what I mean by that is it, 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 the, there is a mechanism by which, as things stand now, employers can fairly uh, dismiss their employees and re-engage them on less favourable terms and conditions. There are legal obligations that um, that exist and that have to be complied with, but I suppose as a headline point, um, it is possible and it it is more easy in, uh, in, in under the sort of legislative provisions in this country than it is, um, you know, uh, uh, compared to other European just, uh, jurisdictions that I'll, that I'll touch upon at the end. Um, but there are there are sort of um, legal there are some legal obligations that an employer has to bear in mind um, when it seeks to uh, fire uh, and then rehire its staff. And I suppose the first one is that in larger scale uh, fire and rehire exercises. And when I talk about larger scale, I really mean in any situation where an employer wants to dismiss and re-engage 20 or more employees, um, then collective consultation obligations arise. Um, and what that means is that, a, uh, that an employer has to uh, collectively consult either with a trade union, if the trade union is recognised in the workplace, or it has to appoint appropriate representatives to consult with in those workplaces where a trade union is not recognised. Um, and the reason the collective consultation uh, obligations is apl apply is because the def what, the sort of what the law states is that where an employer is proposing to dismiss as redundant twenty or more employees at one establishment, then the, the then the then the, uh, the 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 obligation to collectively consult kicks in. And the definition of dismissal as in redundant expressly includes a situation where you want to dismiss uh, uh, your employees and re-engage them on those new terms. So that's why the duty to collectively consult uh, applies, um, notwithstanding you, you might think, well, nobody's being made redundant, uh, but because the term uh, dismiss as redundant has a wider uh, a wider definition under the collective consultation obligations and therefore it is engaged in that situation. And what collective consultation must involve is uh, uh, consulting with a union or as I say with appropriate representatives where the union is not uh, uh, recognised about ways of uh, avoiding dismissals, uh, reducing the number of dismissals and mitigating the consequences of those dismissals. Um, and so that exercise would be undertaken for at least 30 days if there's 20 or more employees and for uh, 45 days if there are 100 or more employees. And no notices of dismissal should be served until that exercise is concluded. Um, I mean, a couple of points to make about that exercise. I mean, the weakness, if you like, in the legislation is that while a trade union rep trade union representatives have the right to be heard, uh, they don't have the right to prevail. So in, in essence, what an employer has to do is it has to listen to the representations that are made uh, by the union, 
but it isn't uh, obliged to act upon them. So you can still have a situation where the the uh, process um, it still goes through and employees are dismissed, notwithstanding the fact if the union is able to sort of undermine the exercise um, and, and and show that you know that it's not credible in many circumstances, that wouldn't necess- that wouldn't equate to uh, a breach of the regulations. However, I mean, I suppose where there is uh, some use in these uh, um, in these obligations is very much around the, the sort of information that the employer is uh, um, obliged to provide. Um, and specifically, the employer is obliged to provide information around the, re- the reasons for the proposals. And there is some helpful case law now um, that makes it clear that 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 um, information should include the economic reasons behind a decision. And that relates to a case, um, uh, I think it was in around 2010, a UK coal mining case, where a sort of employer used misleading uh, reasons for its proposals about closing a, a specific workplace. Um, and one of the arguments they tried to subsequently deploy as well as no, you know, we're not required to give any information around um, the sort of economic reasons, because that's um, what they said was piercing the corporate veil, if you like, and giving information that uh, of a sort of economic nature that that that, that um, they didn't think they were obliged to. And the court said that, uh, you know, if you're providing information about the reasons for the dismissal, that necessarily I- includes economic, uh, you know, sort of economic rationale for the decision. And that can be very useful because that can be useful a both uh, legally because I suppose in some circumstances, like in that case, it was possible to show that the sort of the the, the reasons behind the proposal were uh, misleading and were not actually uh, you know accurate and, and and true. But also, I suppose it also provides information in the course of the process that can be very useful from a campaigning uh, perspective as well. So uh, the obligation, as I say, is to collectively consult. And once that uh, consultation process comes to an end, then at that point, the employer can uh, issue notices to terminate. If the collective consultation obligations haven't been adhered to, then it is open for a union or uh, appropriate representatives to lodge a claim for a protective award. So that, that's the sort of first obligation around a, a fire and rehire exercise, a duty to collectively consult. Um, the second reason is that uh, sort of duty in a distinct area is that an employer has to have a fair reason uh, upon which to make a dismissal. Um, and that implies, you know, whether it's a, a collective exercise of 20 or more or whether it's a, a smaller exercise. Now, the fair reason that is uh, given in a fire and rehire exercise is known as some of the substantial reason. And it, it's a kind of catch all category um, that an employer is entitled to rely upon as a potentially fair reason for dismissal. Um, so it sits alongside the, 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 you know, the more obvious reasons such as redundancy, misconduct, capability. Um, but some of the substantial reason is, is sort of held to be a fair reason in, in these circumstances. And, and the case law um, around this is um, not particularly helpful in a sense of the low threshold that needs to be applied to establish some of the substantial reason. And the lead case on that is a case called Hollister and National Farm Association, an old case, which effectively says that an employer just needs to be able to show a sound business reason for uh, undertaking an exercise and dismissing on those terms. Um, But as well as having a a potentially fair reason, the employer also has to follow a fair procedure um, with respect to carrying out dismissals. And that will involve things like um, the information that it provides to individual employees and the the sort of quality of the consultation um, that it undertakes. There is also a little bit of developing case law uh, around uh, the requirement to sort of deal with the equity of such a decision. And as one helpful uh, case in particular from, um, uh, I think it's around 2010, it's a case of uh, uh, Laycock and Garside. And that said that uh, tribunal should also consider the sort of overall equity of the decision. And in that case, for example, one thing they took into consideration 
was whether the sort of detrimental changes that were going to be introduced uh, by these proposals had been acro applied across the workforce as a whole, or had they just been sort of targeted at specific um, sort of sectors of the workforce, in particular the sort of lower paid uh, workforce. And in that case, they, 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 the tribunal reached a decision that, it is, that, that you know, dismissal can be unfair if it hasn't been applied equally and there isn't sort of a um, equal pain, if you like, across the organization as a whole. Now, that's just one decision, and that area hasn't uh, sort of more fully developed yet, but that, you know, potentially represents uh, a, an argument that can be deployed around uh, the potentially fair reason, some of the substantial reason. But I mean, I do caveat that in the sense that it is some of the substantial reason does remain a sort of um, a, a, a potentially fair reason that can be deployed and it's sort of seen, if you like, in, 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 as something that, that, that can justify these these types of proposals. So unfortunately, the, the case law is difficult and it will only really be if we get some sort of further development in that area that we may be able to, to, to sort of um, counter these proposals further. Um, the final thing, just to talk on quickly in terms of areas of law is also potentially the uh, issue of unlawful inducement. And that can arise in situations where an employer makes an offer directly to employees uh, about revised terms and conditions and fails to collectively consult with the unions or um, it doesn't exhaust collective bargains before approaching employees. Now, the case law in that area, there is a style that many of you will probably have heard of who are listening today, and that will give us some further clarity as to exactly when that uh, provision can be engaged. Unfortunately, the Court of Appeal decision uh, was not helpful to trade unions in the sense that it, it said that this provision was only engaged when an employer intended to terminate collective bargaining arrangements uh, altogether on a permanent basis, as opposed to just uh, not collectively bargaining in any one exercise. Um, we hope, though, that that decision might be re repealed. And if it is, um, then potentially that can be a useful exercise, uh, sorry, a useful area of law which unions would be able to rely on because it means it is more difficult for employers uh, to potentially make offers of new to it, it may become more difficult for employers to make um, offers of new terms and conditions um, if they haven't, it's certainly at least if they haven't exhausted collective bargaining mechanisms uh, fully but we, we won't have a decision probably on that until July, uh, probably until September actually of uh, this year, given the case is, is not gonna be heard till May. So there are the three areas of law that are potentially, I think, engaged. Um, but I mean, I suppose just to conclude, I mean, uh, as I said at the start, the, the, the problem is that per se, the, the, you know, the, the, it, it does remain uh, permissible to fire and rehire. And that is why, um, you know, it's important to have a strong industrial campaign running alongside uh, uh, to oppose such measures. Um, and that does contrast with what we see on the continent, uh, where these exercises would be much more difficult to undertake. And I think that's for three main reasons, which I'll, I'll just quickly uh, run through. The first reason is that courts um, in Europe are much more um, uh, are much more able and much more minded to, but I suppose much more able is importantly, to interfere with economic decisions and particularly to require evidence, uh, more evident evidence based approaches to what economic, you know, what the economic situation is and require employers to give more detailed evidence as to why these proposals are justified. Unfortunately, as the law stands in this country, the requirement on that is fairly low. So while they do have to provide information, it's very limited as to how you can interrogate that. The second reason why um, on the continent is this is more difficult is because um, uh, the collective consultation obligations are stronger. So in a country like France, there is uh, obligations on companies to consult with trade unions and workplace representatives on an annual basis about economic, you know, economic conditions uh, within organizations. And we don't have those sort of stronger collective consultation obligations uh, in this jurisdiction. And I suppose the final reason really is that um, industrial action in this country, uh, which is often used as a tactic to oppose uh, fire and rehire exercises, is we're seeing some of the, the sort of larger scale ones that are happening um, 
in this country at the moment. I mean, the problem with that is in this country, it sometimes takes several weeks in which to conduct a lawful ballot as a result of all the various legal loopholes that you have to jump through and adhere to in order to call people out on strike. Those uh, regulations are not as rigorous on the continent and therefore um, uh, employing organisations are able to take action um, more quickly uh, and, and sometimes I guess more effectively uh, to be able to oppose those regulations. So I think there's sort of three areas in which um, the uh, legislation in this country uh, leads us into a situation where it is easier for an employer um, to, um, uh, to, to, to undertake an exercise um, of that type. Um, so I hope that is sort of a, just a, a useful overview of the sort of the, the various legislative uh, provisions that are, up, are applied um, and I'm happy to sort of answer any questions and, and touch on some of those issues now. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Neil. Um, that was really interesting as um, to give us some background information on the legal situation in this area. Um, I think you provided a lot of detail, which, which was fantastic. Um, we've had quite a few questions come in already, so I'm going to try and, and get to as many of them as we can. Um, just to um, remind our audience, we, we can't give specific legal advice on the webinar. We'll try and give general help to a situation, but we can't we can't like give a specific legal advice to to your um, unique situation. But but I'll try and um, I'll try and generalize the questions a little bit. OK. So we've had a question that asks if an employer can two piece someone to another company and not preserve their terms and conditions. Um, the general the general rule in a two piece situation is that you would transfer across and maintain your uh, current terms and conditions of employment. So a harmonization exercise sort of as a general principle would be unlawful. Um, so you would normally, um, uh, the normal rule would be yes, that you should transfer across on your uh, and maintain your current terms of terms and conditions of employment. It would only be if the employer could establish that there was um, uh, an ETO that, that that wouldn't be the case. So general rule is that you should you should you should come across on your terms and conditions. OK, thank you. That That's really helpful. Um, we've had a handful of questions, um, all from different people on a similar theme, and they're all around um, independent schools, independent education sector. Um, it seems that this fire and rehire tactic has been being used uh, quite a bit in this sector, specifically to change pensions. Um, can anything be done about this? Uh, one question, one questioner in particular, um, says that the teachers' pension scheme is a contractual right. Um, so, have you got any uh, suggestions for for these situations, please, Neil? Um, I think really it's the same principles. I don't think that it makes any difference in relation to the pension. I agree, it's a contractual right. Um, but I think the same principles would apply that it would still potentially be permissible to uh, dismiss and re-engage on uh, onto new terms and conditions, but subject to um, some of the um, obligations that I've talked about today in, in respect of collective consultation obligations. That would seem to almost certainly apply in that situation if it was going to be made wholesale across the school um, and there would there would need to be a potentially fair reason for the dismissal that could in that situation I think be some other substantial reason with respect to pensions there's also sometimes some very specific consultation obligations relating directly to the scheme so you would need to look at that as well but I'm aware that you know there are exercises of that nature being undertaken and I don't think there you know it's unlikely they would be sort of absolutely unlawful in a particular way unless there was a you know a very specific provision that prevented them being altered um which would be you know quite fact specific to a certain case i would think okay that that that's helpful thank you um okay another question is uh, can an employer restructure delete posts and make staff reapply for what is essentially the same job, but they say is different. Uh, yes, they can do, um, but the obligations are, I mean, there is, in those circumstances, it's probably more likely to be a 
generally speaking, a redundancy situation rather than a fire and rehire. Um, and it tends to be done in that context. And it really depends the obligations on the employer and the sort of legal uh, the legal tests that are applied very much depend upon whether the job is different or not. Uh, where the job is genuinely different, there's much more leeway in how the exercise is undertaken, and employers have a much greater discretion in terms of who they appoint to the role and whether, you know, for example, they don't think internal candidates are suitable. Where in circumstances where the jobs are not genuinely difficult, then they're held to much uh, stricter obligations in terms of uh, appointing internal candidates to the rule i.e because those those rules are suitable alternative employment and therefore should be given to those at, at risk of redundancy but yes i mean there's nothing that makes it unlawful to go through and to sort of have an exercise of that nature and look to restructure and delete posts and advertisements very much about you know how then people are appointed into them and whether a fair procedure is applied but it's it's not unlawful as a as a starting point to to, to undertake an exercise that nature and obviously we see that quite regularly as as well and um, a, a question from me rather than from the audience is yeah um you how would um how would a decision be made as to whether the job is substantially the same is there a test that can be applied you know the, the old job and the new job um is there a kind of test that you can put it through yeah well i mean it, it i guess it's just a question of fact i mean what what, what we would do is uh solicitors is have a look at that have a look at the job descriptions and then talk to the individual uh who used to undertake the rule and ideally when you're trying to present evidence or try to do it in the the new job now that tends to be more difficult because that individual invariably doesn't necessarily want to assist in the case but the tribunal explain um, you know when the issue arises in a tribunal will want an employer to explain precisely why the job is different and and I think you know are aware that these sort of things can be quite artificial in nature as to how a certain job description is worded and want it you know so I don't think that would necessarily be enough to demonstrate that the job was um, different in nature so I think that um, you would need to be able to sort of uh, give I don't know clearer evidence than just you know, being able to assert uh, various, you know, wording is, is suitable. I, mean, I guess it's a bit like those worker status cases where they say, like, the you know, the, the the contract is just one piece of evidence, but what they want to know, what they what courts these days look at is the reality of the situation. And I think that's the same with looking at these sort of exercises to to make that decision on, um, you know, as to whether something is is different or not. Thank you, Neil. Um, another question from our audience. Um, they ask if an employee refuses to accept detrimental new terms, uh, are they then entitled to a redundancy payment or would they be seen as refusing a reasonable alternative employment? Yeah, usually it's not a redundancy situation. As I say, to, uh, when we start, you, the sort of classic fire and rehire exercise, uh, the um, uh, the employer will assert that the, the, the fair reason for the dismissal is not redundancy, but it is some of the substantial reason. Um, and the, 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 you know, the case law supports that. I mean, I think in certain circumstances, if the jobs were fundamentally different you might be able to assert that that amounts to a redundancy situation but generally it will be uh the dismissal will be on the basis of some or some, some of the substantial reason and therefore if you refuse to accept those terms then you will be dismissed on on that ground and not entitled to a redundancy payment and your only recourse would be to the courts for um, a case of unfair dismissal. I think your argument on redundancy would, as I say, would only really come into play if you, if the jobs were sort of intrinsically different, and then you might say you've been sort of made redundant from uh, one post um, and offered, you know, and, and then potentially offered something that was entirely different and therefore have been made redundant. And there's a bit of case law where the, some of the substantial reason and redundancy overlap at the sort of extreme edges, but as a general rule, and in certainly in the sort of large scale exercises we're seeing at the moment, um, that, you know, that there would be no entitlement to a redundancy payment.
that's really helpful to know, Neil, thank you. Um, okay, we've got a question that um, relates to fire and rehire, but it's more about the fairness of, of the act, whether that's not that's legal fairness or just general fairness. Um, so um, the questioner has recently had a fire and rehire scenario uh, within their um, employer. Uh, the employer used the funding gap of the COVID pandemic as a business reason for this move. However, um, it's known that they hold millions of pounds in reserve even after the fire and rehire has taken place and they still have a lot left in reserves. Um, how can this be fair and is there any grounds for um, challenging that from the perspective of a, a workplace rep? Um. Well, I mean, I think certainly on a non-legal perspective, the answer is very clear that, you know, that it is unjust and, sure. um, um, you know, these practices are, uh, you know, it's appalling at the, the sort of scale they're being carried out on. In terms of whether that sort of information makes a dismissal uh, unlawful, I think it doesn't make it unlawful um, in an, any sort of unqualified way. Um, it is, however, potentially information that can be used. I mean, you start getting a little bit closer, I guess, when you see when when facts, when you hear sort of facts like that. So, for instance, when I talked about the UK coal mining case, we talked about an employer. I mean, in that case, um, the employer, I think, had cited that it was closing the, the mine in question as a result of health and safety reasons. And it, it emerged, you know, in, in the course um, of the, the, the sort of tribunal proceedings and through the disclosure that that was a falsehood and it was entirely as a result of, you know, economic conditions and, and, and wanting to make savings. And they were, and, and the, 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 so as I say there, so where I think the employer is misleading the trade union or misleading the workplace uh, representatives and it isn't it isn't portraying in the collective consultation process as a you know as an example a, a sort of a correct and accurate uh, picture then yes that could be grounds on which to pursue a, um, a, a protective award claim um, it could also go to the sort of genuine fairness of the dismissal but that's really about where it's sort of conveying something that's misleading the fact that they have money but still want to make the changes i don't think it goes as far as that so i, I think in that situation it would be more difficult to use that and really that's more around um that gives a lot of sort of i think assistance with the campaigning side of things but probably less so legally but if it was presented in a way that was misleading then i do think that certainly does play into the legal side of it and i guess it also we talked about the equity of the decision earlier and 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 the sort of laycock gar side um uh, example i gave you and i suppose again that could play into that as well so it would be not unlawful in an unqualified way, but it could potentially play into some of the claims that, that might be pursued. Thanks, Neil. Um, we've got a question from somebody who um, works in the charity sector. Um, they say that they're seeing more and more of fire and rehire happening in that sector. Um, the reason that's given is usually that funding has been reduced. Um, could this be a valid reason for charities to do this? Uh, they add that interestingly, um, these um, tactics are never applied to the senior management. It's just to a certain group of staff. Um, so it's not equal across the whole workforce. Um, I mean, yeah, lack, uh, certainly a, a, a reduction in funding would be a sort of um, a, a reason often given for a fire and rehire exercise. And, you know, and, and you hear the, the, the sort of the, the, the way it's presented often is well look um otherwise you know we'd have to make redundancies and this is seen as the alternative so um it's often you know in most cases it will be presented as a, as a lack of funding or a drop in income if you like or or or, or, or put in one of those two ways and then, as you've sort of touched on earlier often the pandemic obviously is features in part of the justification around that um but if it, I mean, it comes back to this point that if it is, there is some case law now that says if it is only applied to certain parts of the workforce and it's not applied um, 
right across the workforce that that can play into whether the dismissal is fair or not. Um, I don't think, you know, I'm not able um, today and I, I, you know, I wouldn't want to say, well, you know, that means that any decision will be unfair unless this sort of, you know, this is applied um, across the across the board in any organization. Unfortunately, I think, you know, the, we wouldn't be able to give that kind of sort of unqualified statement. But what I would say is it, it is a relevant factor. There is some case law that supports it. And I guess most importantly, that even before you get to the dismissal stage, I mean, it's important for unions and representatives and people to be making that point and uh, using perhaps that case law, because I mean, it's a powerful point, because it's a powerful point, I think, in terms of you know, the overall campaign that's being conducted and the sort of message that gets out into the public. But also now it has a real legal relevance um, in respect to that case and, and pressure can be applied about uh, around that. And that may uh, leave us some changes in the proposals. And ultimately, if it doesn't work and it isn't, then, then yes, I think cases could be considered as to whether there is potentially unfair dismissals uh, around that. But I think you know, I wouldn't want to overstate that it is, it, I think it's likely to be a consideration that the tribunal will take when determine whether a decision is fair for some of the substantial reason or not. Um, but I don't think we could say that any dismissal will, will definitely be unfair if it, you know, if it hasn't been uh, moved around, it will, be, it will be fact dependent, but it's certainly a, a pressure point that I think should be, should be used. Thanks, Neil. That's really helpful. Uh, we've got quite, um, I think a maybe technical question here. Um, okay. If a dismissal notice has been reached with no acceptance from the employees, is the employer able to pick and choose who returns if there is subsequently a wish for a collective return? Um, is that a bit complicated? Yeah, I'm not quite sure I understand. Okay. Um, so, Chris, you've posted this. Um, are you able to give us a little bit more detail about that? I mean, I, I've read it out pretty much as you typed it. So um, if you can give us a bit more information, I will come back to it, but I'll, I'll just move on to something else um, now while we're waiting in case, in case Chris isn't here. Okay, another question is, um, is there any wording that people can use or have added to a, to a contract? So say they're signing a new contract, um, but yep. preserve their rights to object later. Is there is there a way to do that? And if so, what would the wording be? Um, oh, so do you mean um, when we're talking about object, do we think we mean to what to the so oh, sorry, I think what you mean is to the new term. So if yes, you sign, yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, sorry, um, I should have said that. Yeah, no, They're no, signing no, no. A, new, a new contract yeah, in yeah. terms of conditions. Can they reserve their right to object at a later date? No, mo most most employers now in, in most of the exercises where they're sort of being legally advised say that you that they won't accept anything uh, where it does that. So um, you're under... Um, you, you sort of have to make your decision of what an employer will now say um, in most cases is, look, you've got to make your decision. You can either accept it or you don't. And if you don't, you'll be dismissed on these grounds. And, you know, it's a matter for you as to whether you want to challenge that. But we think it's a potentially fair reason. Um, so, no, it's becoming much more difficult to do that because, you know, there were various tactics in the past sort of around trying to to do it under protest or to lodge grievances. But now um, most employers certainly who are getting advice will will will, will simply say, look, you, you either choose it or you you don't. Right. Okay, thank you. That's really quite clear there, isn't it? It's yeah, um, I mean, more you can, and more than you can yeah, you can try um um and query what good it really I mean it I suppose that potentially you could use it legally, particularly if you were subsequently going to resign and claim constructive dismissal or something like that. But, um, but now they are generally, from what we see, they 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 simply don't want to get into that and won't won't allow people to to do that. That's certainly uh, my sure. recent experience on it. Um, our, the original questioner has followed up saying, um, "Could they say they're signing under duress?" I will. I imagine a, you're going to say no. Yeah, it's, it's the, same, same, it's the same point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, exactly. You either sign it and then remain silent or you don't. 
Yeah, I mean, I think you, you, yeah, <laughs> effectively, I think that's right. I mean, um, you're left to Hobson's choice. It's incredibly difficult. But I think once you sign, you're invariably deemed to sort of have accepted the variation that there's no dismissal, um, no sort of un unlawful deduction of work because you, you you varied your terms and, you, and you're left without a remedy. But, you know, the alternative is trying to fight uh, an unfair dismissal claim and that, and that's difficult for the reasons I've sort of, sort of touched on in the presentation so it is difficult um, but you're unlikely to be able to do it by saying this is under duress because most employers now particularly if they're getting advice will, will, will say no we're not having it on that basis. Thanks Neil. Uh, we've had a question um, that we've actually covered in a previous webinar. It's about um, unfair dismissal. Um, Alice is going to post a link to that webinar in the chat so that anyone who's on this webinar can watch that. I think it's, you know, um, we've possibly even done two. So there's um, a good hour and a half of information about unfair dismissal that we'll, we'll point you towards in the chat. Right. Um, Right, I was at another question ready. Okay, so could an employer force um, employees to work from home post the COVID pandemic to save money? Can they do that without a change in contract? Um, well, it will depend upon what your contract says um, as a starting point. So whether they first, the first thing would be to sort of look at the terms of the contract and say what it provides around your where your place of work will be and also around whether there are any sort of variation clauses in there or, or, or clauses that permit them to require you to work from different places. If there is such a clause, then they may rely upon that to do it. If there isn't such a clause, then they would require your consent to change your place of work on a permanent basis. And, and what they would need to do is um, seek your consent. And if you were not willing to give that consent, then you would almost be, as we were talking about at the start, you know, you, ultimately, if they want to force through that that change, the only basis they could do that on them would be a sort of dismissal and re-engagement exercise. So they would need your consent or your union's consent, because potentially your union could collectively agree that change and it would be incorporated into your contract. Um, otherwise, they, they can't do that without going through a, a sort of dismissal and re-engagement exercise. Thanks. That's that's really helpful. OK, another question about um, fire and rehire specifically. Mm. When you talked about collective consultation, mm -hmm. does that have to explicitly be about the proposal to fire and rehire on different terms? Uh, the questioner says that consultations are being undertaken on proposed substan substantial changes to terms of employment without the intention being made explicit. Um, I think that employers um, are mindful now because what happens is that the obligation is triggered when you're proposing to dismiss as redundant. And employers sometimes, um, and to some extent they're right about this, become when they're wanting to make contractual changes, um, they will feel they need to enter into a sort of lodge their HR ward and um, collectively consult because they will say or they will be concerned a union might say, well, look, you have decided at this point that if you are not able to um, make these changes, then you're going to dismiss and re-engage and therefore that obligation should be triggered. And that's why they sort of formally start that process. However, there's no obligation. I mean, if, if, they, if they just genuinely want to change a term and condition, but they are sort of in the mindset, well, if we can't get this agreed, then we can't get this agreed, but we're going to try to. Then then the, the sort of collective consultation obligations in the formal sense don't apply, but, you, you, but they would be expected to sort of just to sort of consult on a general basis. And then they could always subsequently then if they decided that they had to sort of bring about the changes through another mechanism, you know, had to bring about the changes, they could then enter into the sort of formal collective consultation obligations. 
Thanks. Uh, we've had another couple of questions about the collective consultation. Um, so I'm going to try and combine two here. Um, can you clarify the minimum consultation timelines, um, for example, between 20 and 99 employees? Is the 30 days minimum, um, does that run from launch of consultation to date that notice of dismissal is given or, um, or date that dismissal is effective? Um, can you just clar clarify the general yeah kind sure of so it should be so it should when there's 20 or more at one establishment the collective consultation should be 30 days and that 30 days should begin from when the dismissals are first proposed um through to uh, and conclude before any notices of dismissal are affected and the, the reason for that is because once notices of dismissal are served it, it it's evidence that sort of the decision has been made if you like so um the case law suggests that uh the collective consultation should be complete before any notices are served Thank you, Neil. And kind of related to that question, how long after the end of redundancy consultation is it unreasonable for the employer not to have issued notices of dismissal? Um, I suppose that's the kind of situation where well, normally that's good news <laughs> um, in, a, in the sense that you would think that they are not therefore going to go ahead and make the dismissals. I mean, I suppose I think probably what the point's getting at is at what stage do they then have to con collectively consult again about it being a different proposal, if you like, rather than the one they were intending to dismiss on um, in the first instance. I, I imagine that's what the, 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 the question's getting at. And that's a degree of fact, really, as to whether it is a separate proposal or not. So you can go through a collective consultation process and then you know, employer might delay sort of issuing the notices for a while because it's still considering you know whether economic conditions are going to improve or what's happening and then it might then serve those notices and say well we don't have to reconsult because this is still about our original proposals as it were um i think that's that then becomes a question of fact as to whether it really is or whether the intervening facts are such that it becomes a, a new proposal if it's a new proposal, does the clock start again? Yeah, so if it was a new proposal, we would say that the collective consultation obligations have to, to, to begin again, yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, we've had a question about transparency and um, if an employer is not being full and frank about their financial inf uh, financial situation, um, they have got, uh, the, the questioner has got an example of, again, private sector schools often saying no to disclosing this, citing commercial confidentiality. Um, are, what are the arguments that workplace reps can use to get this information from the employer? Um, I think that there are, well, certainly there is now case law that says the reasons for the proposals include the economic uh, reasons, and that's the, the UK coal mining case that I quoted uh, earlier. So that is a, a mechanism or a case, as it were, that can be relied upon in the collective consultation to say that you, um, that you require that information. There's also, if the union is recognize there are also provisions in Tulaka where you can make an application to uh, the CAC to get uh, financial information. I mean, a certain provisions, there's certain sort of criteria that you have to meet, but that is also uh, worth uh, looking at. But if you're actually in the exercise, as it were, of a sort of dismissal and rehire over uh, financial circumstances, then I would use the, the, the UK coal mining case and rely upon that is the basis upon which you know that that information is relevant um, to your proposals and therefore should be provided. Thanks, Neil. Um, if there are fewer than twenty people who are being potentially fired and rehired, do they have any protection? And if so, what would it be? So they don't. None of the collective consultation obligations won't apply. But the bit that where we talked about there still having to be the fair reason for the dismissal, that does still apply. So then you move on to obviously the sum of the substantial reason. Um, but then the equity of the decision, the reasonableness of it, the, you know, the, the point we talked about, about whether it's been applied across the workforce as a whole, those sort of considerations, they would apply in the same um, in the same way. Thanks.
Uh, is there any scope for using the Equality Act or other legislation as part of a challenge against fire and rehire? For example, if an employer has admitted that their proposals will disproportionately affect, for example, female workers or any other group that um, have a protected characteristic? Yeah, no, absolutely, there is. It's not a sort of conventional, um, you know, when I talked about a sort of three uh, points at the start, they are the sort of the conventional uh, areas of law around fire and rehire. But yeah, I mean, you could get circumstances where there is uh, an indirectly discriminatory effect around the proposals, and then it would come down to whether that could be objectively justified. Um, but it is definitely a relevant legal consideration. And I could see that in some cases, it would be possible to to deploy that and you know like the questioner the there the seems to be sort of when there's evidence already of a disproportionate impact then obviously that's very helpful and then you're just moving on to the consideration of whether it can be objectively justified now there'll be some circumstances where it can and in others where it will be more difficult for an employer to meet that threshold um but yes it's it's going to be a, a key part of any sort of analysis a legal analysis on challenging you know challenging the proposal Excellent. Thank you. Um, right. Just looking at the time, we've, we've had over 50 questions and we, we've got through a fair chunk of them. I'm just going to see if we can fit in a couple more before okay. we finish. But it, it's been really great so far, Neil. Thank you. Um, so you talked a bit earlier about how the situation is quite different in the UK than it is in, in wider Europe. Mm. It's quite an unusual situation. Um, uh, one of one of our audience asked is was there not a proposal for a bill to go through parliament that would effectively make this illegal um she thinks maybe it was mentioned last year is this is do you know of anything could this change in the future the last thing that i heard on this was that the government had asked acas uh, to undertake a uh, a report into the practice of fire and rehire so it could be considered um and that is, just, that is, insofar as I know, I don't know what happened to that report and whether that report, I'm not, I'm not clear whether that report was submitted to government, whether, whether they now have it and haven't acted on it or, or not. Um, so I guess like with anything with, with these things, I mean, if there was a, a, a real will to take it on, then yes, there are certainly provision, there are certainly legislative changes that could be uh, made that would, 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 if not necessarily, well, could outlaw the practice or certainly could make the practice more difficult. Uh, whether there's a political will to do that, I would think is questionable. Um, but certainly it, it, ACAS were asked to, to, to look at it. Um, but I, I, as far as I know, I've never, never heard where that got to. OK, I think maybe it'll be a case of watching this space and we'll see. We'll see what happens um, maybe later this year or next year. Um, could you just remind us, please, Neil, what the case law is about um, the situation needing to be equal or equity across the, across the organisation, just so we, we couldn't quite remember? Yeah, sorry, it's a case called Garside and Laycock. I haven't got the uh, citation with me, but it is that's the, the two parties. I think sure. it's around sort of it's about ten years old now. What what we'll do, Neil, is we'll we'll get you to email this to us, and we'll we'll send it out in a in a link to our sure audience so we've got you know we, we can link to it exactly um okay um at what point should a claim for a protective award be made um would it be when the employee receives a notice giving date of dis of their dismissal or earlier uh it would very it wouldn't be earlier it would uh i mean the 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 conventionally it's usually done after employees are actually dismissed albeit it could be done in the notice period there's no requirement to wait till the employees are dismissed um so you can make a protective award claim um pre um you know pre you wouldn't make it until after the sort of collective well gen genuine generally you certainly wouldn't make it until a collective consultation process is completed but you could make it from that point on thank you um Okay, we might have already covered this, but this is possibly uh, phrased slightly differently. So during the consultation pro process, could an employer say to their staff that if they want to keep their jobs, they must agree to new contracts without giving details of what these new terms and conditions can be, um, are going to be? 
Um, that would be risky, I think, because there is, um, I think that there is sort of that would play into not providing all the information I think that is required under the collective consultation obligations. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, that just inherently feels wrong to me. And um, I wouldn't be, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think that could be challenged. That's helpful, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go for two more questions. I think they're quite quick. Um, just so we, we've covered these off as well. Um, so a viewer has asked, um, says employers are making changes to terms and conditions where they have more than 100 staff affected, but a number of different workplaces. Um, they then state there's no requirement to consult because there are fewer than 20 at each individual site. Can they get away with this? Yeah, uh, the laws, not entirely consistent with this, but generally unhelpful. The lead case is a, it, it's commonly sort of known as the Woolworths case. And that you'll remember that's why Woolworths went into administration and they determined that each of the Woolworths stores was a separate establishment for the purposes of collective consultation. And the case went all the way up to, to Europe and came back down and they determined that it could be. And what that meant was that some the people working in stores with, with less than 20 weren't able to, um, weren't able to sort of claim a protective award from their, the administration so yes they can i mean it, it you, ha you have to look carefully as to whether they 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 definitely are separate establishments but there's quite a bit of on the back of that case there's quite a bit of leeway for an employer to be able to show they're separate establishments and that so that can be a way of sadly of getting around those obligations Thanks, Neil. Um, like you say, it's it's the law's unhelpful here, but it's reasonably clear. So thanks for that. OK, I think final question here, which is quite a practical one. If employees do sign a new contract and they're rehired, are, is there scope for them to keep continuity of employment, for example, over probation periods, holiday titles, seniority, etc., etc.? Yeah, they usually maintain continuity of employment in those circumstances. Yes, so they would do. But would it be on a um, you know case by case basis? Um, no, I mean that, that it, it depends upon precisely what the sort of time frame is and whether the re-engagement is immediate as to whether it would break continuity. But the standard position is it doesn't break continuity if it's if it's immediate. Right. Thank you, Neil. Um, OK, we rapidly sped through very nearly an hour here. Um, as I said, we had over 50 questions and we've 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 answered a fair chunk of those. And um, if we didn't answer your question um, specifically, I hope we've covered it in other areas. Um, but we will take all questions on board and use it to inform advice and guidance that we put out there for you. Um, if you missed it earlier, we are also here at the TUC. We're really keen to hear about what is happening in individual workplaces on this subject. Um, we will treat all situations with confidentiality, uh, confidential, confidentially. So if you want to share your story with us, please email us on tuceducation at tuc.org.uk. We'll be putting that email address in the chat panel in just a second. If you email us on that, um, we'll get back to you with, um, with, with, you know, with how we might use this information to inform the work that we do, the campaigning we do. Um, right. So we um, are going to wrap up for today. Um, thank you so much, Neil, for joining us. You've been fantastic. Um, we've learned so much about fire and rehire and um, I think as it's an ever-changing area of employment, it may well be something we come back to in the future. So thank you. Um, thank you again. Thank you to our audience. You've all been brilliant as well. And um, we've had some brilliant questions from you, really insightful. Um, thank you also to my colleague, Alice, who's been busy in the chat, um, answering so many questions and posting links. Um, she's been on every webinar that we've had um, over the past year and before that, but it's probably going to be her last webinar for a while because she's leaving us temporarily um, to take up another role in the TUC. So you won't see her on here for quite some time. Um, she'll be very much missed. Um, but yes, thank you all. And we'll see you again soon for another webinar. Stay safe in the meantime. Bye bye for now. Thank you. Bye.